I just found out that knowing who your dad is, is of utmost important. My man, Justin, cue us up to what we were just talking about off air. Yeah. So um, for this podcast, I thought it'd be relevant to let you know that I found out in 2009 that my dad wasn't my real biological father. My mom, my parents went through a divorce in 2009 and uh, through a lot of deception on my dad's part. Uh, he had like this secret life that he had built. So that ended their marriage. And my mom felt convicted about keeping a secret from me. And so she confessed um, when I was 36 that that my, my dad adopted me when I was two, that he wasn't my biological father. Uh, she then told me who my dad was. And so I met him three years later. Uh, he had gotten diagnosed with uh, terminal brain cancer. And so I had about a three-month window that if I wanted to meet him, that I was able to do that. So I went and met him, went through yearbook pictures. You know, obviously he apologized for not being there for me because he was told that he was my biological dad as well. Uh, I'm six foot three, he's five nine. There was no structural, like hands, face, nothing that looked similar, even in high school pictures. And so I left that meeting and just thought, this isn't the guy. So I called my mom and confronted her about it. And she's like, no, that's the guy. And, um, and so that was in 2013. And then uh, in 2021, I was doing a funeral and I'm, I'm a pastor. And so uh, my half sister and my half brother, whom I had never met, were at this funeral. And so I introduced myself to, well, my sister introduces herself to me at the head of the casket um, as my sister, which is a very odd thing for a funeral. Um, it's an odd thing in general, but especially as a funeral, at a funeral. And so um, that feeling kind of came back eight years later that I'm not related to this person. And so I asked her if she would do Ancestry.com with me. And she agreed. And so we did Ancestry.com and neither of us came up in the other person's timeline. And uh, so all these people that I did not know came up in, in my, uh, you know, in my family tree. Well, at the same time, my wife was trying to discover more of her Hispanic heritage and her, her maiden name is Lopez. And it came back that she was 0% Hispanic. And, um, and so, which is a problem when your dad is a hundred percent Hispanic. And so she asked her mom about it and her mom admitted to an affair 46 years ago. And so within a span of six days, my wife and I found out that our dads weren't our dads, me for the second time, and then my wife for a devastating first time. And so that's been a really a two-year journey for us of kind of rediscovering identity and overcoming abandonment issues and et cetera, et cetera. I think this is so critical from a generational pattern element where there is a pattern of your parents and the behaviors that they engaged in. Mm -hmm. And then there's this discovery and pain as the son and daughter later on in adult life and, and having, uh, when my father passed, my biological father passed, it was the same year that my eldest daughter was born. And so okay. like super great high and then hold that when that would be filled, how have you been navigating that particular element? And in particular, I would we really interested to know what you've been transparent about with your family mm -hmm. and then what are the decisions that you've made around that for your family and, and any steps you've taken after that? Well, I mean, it's, it's, that's a multi-layered question. And I think it's really relevant because, um, my story is, um, my wife and I were married and we've been married for 28 years. Um, and we got married when I was, when we were in college so we got married young, four months into marriage, we found out that Trish was pregnant with her oldest son, Micah. So we, we you know, kind of grew up with, with our kids in, in a sense. I was 21 and Trish was 20 when they were married or when they were, when my our oldest son was born. And so, um, but the sins of the father kind of repeat themselves, right? And so um, 10 years into marriage, I had an affair with Trish's best friend and that sexual brokenness piece that we didn't even really know existed in our families at that time um, really became the central part of our story. And so we were separated for two and a half months and um, didn't talk for 10 days. And, and I started going to counseling by myself, not knowing if I was going to get a second chance in our marriage and, and began to repair our relationship. And one of the things that we discovered is at that time, we thought that the brokenness that we'd experienced, I was sexually abused when I was a kid 
and never talked about it. And then I struggled with pornography for the first 10 years of our marriage, never, never confessed that. And so there was that hidden piece of sexuality that I thought was kind of the, the genesis of the marriage problems that we had, having no idea the backstory of our parents' choices, right? And so we worked really hard over, you know, over the course of the last 18 years since that event happened, really to to be people of truth and to have, you know, have a trust as a, you know, kind of the foundation of our relationship and, and understand that we're not perfect. But, um, and then when we get this news first in 2009 about my dad and his secret life, and then my mom and the secret that she had kept from me, um, it really begins to, you begin to understand your own story more as you discover some of the hidden parts of your family history. And, and so I think it's been not just educational, but very kind of enlightening for us to be able to hopefully pass on to our kids um, kind of a different legacy and a different, I mean, obviously the history is history. We can't change that, but how we respond and how we move forward and, and the legacy that we create can be different um, by the choices that we make. It sounds like this is really related to not hiding failure. One of the things you're, one of your takes is not hiding failure from your kids. Mm-hmm. So it, it sounds like you're like, Hey, this is something that happened. This is something <clears throat> that's aligned in the behavior, the genetic behavior of my makeup. And this is what, what going on. How did, how did they, I mean, how old were they and how did they handle this piece? Yeah, that's a great question, Jay. Um, my, my kids were nine, six, and three, uh, when the affair happened, when, when Trish and I were separated and obviously, you know, they were impacted. We were separated for two and a half months. And so we had a mediator initially that got our, got them back and forth between houses and, um, and, you know, they were, you know, obviously devastated and and scared that we were going to get divorced and everything was very uncertain, but what it, it gave us an opportunity to really, in an age appropriate way, be as upfront and honest about the mistakes that we've made, what we're working on, uh, things that we want them to know that, um, you know, this relationship just didn't happen. It wasn't like I woke up one day and said, I'm going to have this relationship. It was a gradual descent into really poor choices. And so helping them understand temptation, helping them understand um, secrecy and how nothing good grows in secret and how, you know, our family, we need to create a place of safety, a place of truth and grace so that you can bring your full self and you know that even if you have messed up, you're still going to be loved. And I think that's the the essence of what safety is. It's knowing that no matter what, I'm still going to be accepted. I'm still going to belong. And then that frees us up to be more truthful and more honest uh, with the people that we love the most. And so I think looking back on it now, um, you know, it was a it was a really good thing for our kids because they got to see real time restoration. They got, you know, we're people of faith and we believe that God restores and redeems. And so they got to see redemption take place. And I think so often we don't necessarily allow our kids to see our failures and then they're, then they're robbed of the process of forgiveness. They're robbed of the process of grace. They, they don't get to see how we're dependent on God uh, for our strength or for our renewal, because we try to hide everything and make, make them think that we're perfect or all put together. And so as much as we can, we've let them into, not that they carry our burdens, but that they understand, Hey, we're not perfect. And we need to seek forgiveness just as much as you guys do. And I think it's, it's created a culture in our family where there's, you're not encouraged to fail, but if you do fail, you know that it's not fatal or final. I love that. Uh, it reminds me a lot of uh, the Tim Keller. I was listening to one of his various talks on Galatians. Uh, it's my favorite book. And he talks about the hubris of saying to God, hey, you know, I'm going to go solve this other thing that I need to do before I can have a better relationship with you. And how that's really counter to what what Jesus actually says in the New Testament. He's like, no, no, um, I forget the specific verse, but he talks about coming to him as a child. Hmm. And so in that world, and if we think about the relationship, it's a child comes to their parent, 
with absolute everything. All requests, all emotions, all desires, all wants, all needs must be fulfilled by the parent. And uh, I love this story as an example of, I mean, number one, of having the biblical teaching, but then as well, the reconciliation and the repair and the practice of Mm. active forgiveness, I think is a really great model. And even if you are a secular feel-good father, I really do believe that what Justin is highlighting for us is specifically the act of, of repair and yeah, how it's not yeah. passive. You can't think it or dream it. You have to talk through it. You have to put it out there. You have to intend it. You have to teach and you have to you know, have the conversation. So thanks, yeah. thanks for walking us through that example. Uh, this is obviously related to your next, your next point, which is you should not be embarrassed to talk to your kids about sex. And yeah. so can let let's jump into this. Yeah, so one of the <clears throat> one of the axioms that Trish and I came up with especially after our story kind of broke open but after we knew that my dad's hidden, you know, life and then after the affair came out and my pornography struggles, one of the axioms that we kind of adopted as a family is sex doesn't embarrass us. And it was just this mantra that hey, we're going to talk about it may be uncomfortable but it doesn't have to be embarrassing. And I think, you know, sometimes we put shame onto things um, out of our own brokenness and sex was never created to be a shameful act. It was created by God uh, to give us freedom and enjoyment and obviously procreation. And so just adopting that mantra and that perspective, you know, it helped our uh, at the time we had three biological boys. Now we've since adopted two other kids and a boy and a girl. Um, but you know, for our three biological kids, they obviously they never felt like full permission. Cause you always have that sense of, when you're going through puberty, you know, there's always a sense of, you know, embarrassment, but there was always this, um, recognition that, Hey, we're going to, we're going to talk about this stuff. And I took my boys through, um, each of each of them through uh, books on sex and we would go every Friday before school, uh, fr- probably from the time they were in fifth or sixth grade all the way through maybe their freshman year of high school. We would uh, just spend an hour a week just kind of talking through dating and sex and, you know, the changes that your body's experiencing and temptations and struggles and insecurities and and just having those conversations, I think, set them up to understand sex, their own sexuality. I think it set them up to respect women, um, in a, in a way that is honoring to them and not, you know, uh, sexualize them. And, um, and so that's been kind of a really important aspect of, you know, being a dad is the only thing that my dad ever told me about sex is don't have it before you're married. Um, that was basically it. And then, um, you know, when I got into high school and I think he recognized that maybe that was going on, he's like, I just hope you're using protection so you don't get pregnant like your mom. And so there was, that was really the only, you know, aspect I never felt comfortable going to my dad and talking to him about, you know, uh, temptation or, you know, pornography or anything like that. And so, um, just wanting to change the, the paradigm for our kids was kind of the, the desire and, um, you know, for better, or for worse, um, our, my, my boys endured it. And, uh, and, and I think they're, they're better men now they're, you know, my oldest is 27. My middle son is 24 and my youngest biological son is 20. And so they're on the other side of it now where I think they're, they're thankful for that openness and that, that ability to talk about those things. I think it's so important in today when there's so many people and so much competition for attention and competition for the message and the influence that we really do have a sense of some sort of familial value and that we can extend those teachings. I I think a lot about um, a a man I respect a lot, Scott Galloway, and he was on uh, the Bill Maurer show and he said, one of the real marks of, of a man is can you extend your values and teachings and mentorship to people that are not your biological kids. That's not necessarily something that we've talked about here, but I know Mm -hmm. that in your work as a pastor and everything else that's going on, that there's a journey outside of this conversation that probably happened as well. And um, just as a pillar, as a leader in the community, that it's likely that you walked that path um, for them. And I think of the challenges that 
young men face today in, especially with regard to temptation about just, I mean, keeping it in the pants and having that <laughs> personal responsibility, self-control and ownership of everything that's going on for them. As feel good fathers, you know, I, I say a lot that the two, the two emotions that we have to contend with are anger and lust. Hmm. And it's like, as a man, those are the two things. If we can have those things under control, I think a lot of the decisions we, we make in life are just, will be, will be much better um, and yeah. higher quality. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if you've ever heard this quote, but I've heard someone quote this. I wish I had knew the source, but like anger as a man is usually unhealed wounds, right? There's mm-hmm. unhealed wounds from our past that cause us to, you know, struggle with anger. And we project those, that, that those wounds that we haven't identified or haven't healed um, on, onto others. And so that's been a huge thing for me over the years is just trying to identify the places in my life that I've felt broken so that I don't then take those things out on the people that I love the most. I would love to add, (laughs) add to that concept. So there's that element of the handling the internal traumas and the internal dramas in your life. But I also love Dr. Gabor Matt, Matt, I think is his name. He talked about your emotions and particularly anger also as a, it's a boundary mechanism for your body. You know, Mm. if somebody is, um, the way that I think about anger from a personal branding perspective is a reaction to something that is unfair. And so somebody's infringing on your boundary. If somebody was doing that, you'd especially want to be able to have some sort of physiological response because anger creates adrenaline, a a physiological response to either flee, fight, flee, do something, kind of wake up because like here's this threat in front of me. And so um, I think think for for me, I, I definitely land on the side of emotions, not as something good or bad or to tame or control, but to be aware of and respond appropriately. That's uh, good. I think yeah, that that's like that. something, I mean, what do you think about that? Well, I think, I mean, I think what you're talking about is how, how I would term that and how we talk about it in our, and we, I have a new book, but my wife and I wrote a marriage book and how we talk about it in our marriage book is there's righteous anger, And that's Mm. anger that, you know, you feel and something needs to change. Like it's something like there's an injustice. Yes. Right. And so that's, but then there's destructive anger and that destructive anger is, is unrecognized emotion that you don't necessarily have control over. Um, It's controlling you. And then it also then begins to wound the people around you. And I think making that distinction is very important because yeah, anger is an emotion and I would consider it a gift from God because it's, it's something that does create those boundaries. It, it does, it is a protective aspect uh, for our heart. Um, but at the same time, it's almost like a fire. Fire can be awesome to cook over and it can be awesome to, you know, have a, a to keep warm, but it can also burn your house down. And I think, so, I think a lot about Cain and Abel, like in this situation, right. And you had <laughs> Cain uh, quite directly being tested, you know, if you, what is it? If you do your best, is that not enough? Like, is it mm. not enough that you're doing your best? And then yeah. just Cain, just not being able to reconcile that, that element. And what a, what a great, um, and then repeat it again in Genesis, uh, Joseph, right. With his brothers, that resentment of that. And, and quite frankly, jo- Joseph was a jerk and narcissistic and, and kind right. of lording over the, the vision and, and the promise that, that was delivered to him. But uh, that anger and resentment of the brothers to literally sell him to slavery and, right. and remove him. Uh, that's just, just, that's destructive anger. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's great. Uh, and then, and then we'll, we'll, we'll close that, right? Your righteous anger being Moses, right? Let my people go. And, Oh, that's uh, good. Yeah. You know, yeah. and then just, uh, just to kind of close that circle and close that loop. Um, all right. So, now we have some takes on being a husband and I, and I'm really enjoying where this conversation is going and, and your takes. So admitting brokenness is not weakness. Let's, hmm. you know, let's talk about this. Yeah. I think so often as, as men, um, we're taught, you know, fake it till you make it, or, um, you know, you have to, even if you're don't feel strong, don't let anybody see that you're not strong or, you know, I grew up in a culture you know, I'm 50 years old, so I'm, I'm older. You know, emotion wasn't celebrated. It was something that made you look weak. 
And I think so often what happens is we fake it until we make it and we never make it. So we just keep faking it. And we don't understand why we can't connect to our kids emotionally or why we can't connect to our spouse emotionally if we're married. Or maybe we bounce from relationship to relationship because we have a certain level of depth we can go to. And then once we reach that, then we have to either go deeper or we just start all over. And I think when you recognize that brokenness, and I'm not talking about, um, I'm not talking about necessarily um, mistakes or uh, weaknesses. What I'm talking about is <clears throat> admitting that you don't have it all together is not weakness. It's actually the pathway to transformation. That if when we admit, I don't know the answer, or I don't have it all together, or I'm not doing well, or I'm really struggling with this, that isn't weakness. That's actually the pathway by which we actually grow and become someone different. Mm. This re really reminds me of the idiom when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And then hmm. one of the accesses to that through that door is to say like, Hey, I actually need help in this way. Um, I, I always believe in the way that I've always approached this, this moment for me is the power of being able to ask good questions. And so with any, you know, I, I say it from a relational building networking perspective with five, with the right five questions, you can really build a relationship with anything and anyone. Hmm. But I, but yeah. I think it's the same thing with the right five questions. You can get all the help and, um, and pointers and mentorship that you need from anybody without impinging yeah. directly on somebody's time, which is great. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think so often we try to go it alone, you know, and one of the values of your podcast is, you know, you can have dads that, you know, from their car, from their office, you know, from wherever they are, they're tuning in to get tips and tricks and, and, and hacks to become more connected and, and better fathers. Right. And I think anything that I can do to bring improvement and learn from other people and, and kind of, um, tap into the wisdom of those who have gone before me, I think is a, is a very wise thing to do. I love the, the concept of collective intelligence and collective wisdom. It's actually one of the core reasons why feel good fatherhood exists. So I love it. Thanks for, for calling <laughs> that out. Uh, our next piece here is um, asking for help. This is related to the other part. So the first was admitting brokenness isn't weak and then asking for help in marriage is wisdom, not failure. So yeah. let's, let's talk about this. Yeah. So uh, when my wife and I were separated, um, I, when I admitted the affair, um, it wasn't out of repentance or sorrow. It was, I'm leaving you for another person. And so there wasn't an aspect of, you know, wanting, desiring repair. And one of the things that happened in that process is a lady from our church called me and she said, if you have any hope at all of restoring your marriage, you're going to go to this counseling appointment that we made for you. And I'd been a pastor for 10 years at that point, never been to one counseling session. I just thought, I do counseling. I don't go to counseling. And so I go to this counseling session and the lady, you know, basically says like, why are you here? What do you want from this counseling session? And I said, if I'm just being straight up honest with you, um, I want you to help me figure out how God's going to bless my life, no matter who I choose. Like, that's what I want. And she said something that kind of became the linchpin for the restoration that God would do in my heart and my marriage. She said, I can help broken people. I can't help hard hearted people. Yeah. And I'd been a pastor for 10 years. I've been a follower of, of God for, you know, since I was 10 years old, I'd never really experienced that brokenness before. And I never really felt like I could ask for help. And so it was through the process of counseling. It was through the process of, of admitting that, man, I am a huge failure that I was able to have people speak into my life that had greater wisdom that had been there that had, that were able to help me, you know, stand up and, and dust myself off and move on. And I think so often as guys, we suffer in silence, mm. right? We don't know the answers. We don't know how to overcome some type of relational disconnect with our kids. And so rather than admit that that exists, we just kind of suffer alone. And I think there's probably people in your life, if you're listening to this, that are struggling with the exact same thing that you are, either with your kid or in your marriage. And it's that vulnerability that then opens you up to receiving the help that you desperately need. And oftentimes we just think, well, I should, I should know, I should know by now, or I should, I should have it more together. And when we don't, we, we feel like a failure. And I think 
when we ask for help, that's actually a collective wisdom that we have probably already have in place in our life. We just never have tapped into it. I think, um, I heard this, I heard this once and, uh, I thought it was a really interesting framing of the difference between boys and girls. And so it's sort of like girls need the constant, like they're, they're looking for the constant upkeep, right? Their, their max is a bit lower, but it drains in a day. And so it's like almost every day is an opportunity to sort of refill that bucket, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I thought a really great framing for this for boys and men was that their bucket doesn't necessarily empty as frequently but you have to catch it because the spike in the openness to receiving that wisdom is so short. It's so small. And so yeah. for, for boys and men, we almost need to really pay attention so much more closely to, to where they are and eliminate the idiotic idioms that we've adopted in the country or actually in culture in general, which is like boys will be boys, which is nonsense. What does that mean? Right. You right. Know? the acceptance of, of anything that is, um, I think not relational, positive and contributive, mm -hmm. you know, like I think as, as a people, if we can have better relationships, be more contributive, more of service to each other, I think we can make the world a better place. And, and yeah, I was just to say, I mean, I 100% agree with you. And I think what those things, what those things create is a sense of isolation, mm. right? So there's a sense of, there's a difference between independence and isolation. Independence is a good thing to develop, but that's, that's, that's a life skill, right? Right. But there's also interdependence and that, that, that's that we need each other, you know? Mm. And I think that, that we haven't been taught interdependence because we think it's codependence and, and I think, you know, when we realize, Hey, I, we do need each other. Um, and that's not, that's not weakness or failure. That's, that's just actual wisdom. I think that then we we can actually be more fulfilled in life as husbands and, and as fathers. I, I love this. I've, I've been really paying attention a lot to what some very successful influencers to say about marriage in general and sort of encountering that with the zeitgeist of what, what I would say more traditional mediums are saying about, or more older, older folks are saying about this. I don't even know how to express that. Like who's saying it. It's kind of like, it's a weird thing. Like some of the more negative aspects of society, it's like, it's just ever present and we don't really know what it comes from. But yeah. that was the idea that the best forms of marriage are when two people are, are able to self-actualize. And I think that that, mm. I think that concept is so incredibly toxic because it sets up your spouse. It sets up that life partner as somebody that can infringe on your ability to grow and change and become a new person. Hmm. Whereas I think that the best model for marriage and one that you and I, I know we both agree in it because for many reasons, including the biblical reason that it's about the two becoming one and there are no necessarily independent decisions. It's about what you're doing together. Yeah, exactly. That's good. Awesome. So our, our third point, is total honesty is the path to intimacy. And this is something that all, all feel good fathers want more intimacy. <laughs> uh, let's break this one apart. Yeah. So I think, you know, we kind of talked about this a little bit that I think in our culture, there is a over sexualization of everything, right? So we use sex to sell cars. We use sex to sell hamburgers. And I think there's a, because of the over sexualization in our culture, one, we become desensitized to what actual intimacy is. And the word intimacy literally means to be fully known. And I think we have a desire to be known. We have a fear that we won't be loved. And so oftentimes what happens is we withhold truth in our relationships, not because we want to be liars or because we want to be deceptive, because we're fearful of not being loved or accepted or belonging. And I, I think some of the most fulfilling marriages and some of the most fulfilling relationships um, that I've experienced in my own life personally and, and try to help coach other men uh, to experience in their life is when you are fully known, you're then capable of being fully loved, mm -hmm. right? And so you have a capacity for spiritual, emotional, and physical intimacy. And so I think we have camped out as guys because that's a high value of ours on physical intimacy, but we've shortchanged the need that our wives have of emotional and spiritual intimacy. 
And, but when we can try to find that balance of being fully known spiritually, emotionally, we don't have to manipulate sexually. We don't have to, you know, guilt trip sexually. It's a natural overflow of the relationship that we're already created to experience. Mm. I have a friend who, a friend, uh, a personal branding client as a, as a brand strategist. Uh, she is a friend, but she's also, she talks a lot about boundaries. And I think it's really important to know. And I think sometimes we just got to beat it over the head that none of this is talking about being fully transparent and vulnerable with everybody. No, that would be creepy. That is nobody, <laughs> nobody wants that. And feel good no. father. If this is what you think, stop it. Right. <laughs> so, right, right. So yeah. there, there <clears throat> is a certain level of discernment, which is a yes. critical skill in yep. who deserves this intimacy, who deserves a lesser version of it. Where does everybody live in this world. And it's almost like, Hey, take out a pad of paper, write down the names of the people in your life. Who are you intimate with? Who are you not intimate with? And that doesn't mean sexually just in general, right? Right. Who and not. Well, I think you can be authentic with everyone. Mm. You should only be transparent with a few. Yes. Right. Yes. And, and being real and being trans being authentic is something that I think we experience, um, more satisfaction because then those relationships are actually, um, that, you know, they have value. But I think transparency and vulnerability is something that should be reserved for those who are trustworthy, that there's a level of trust and earning trust that has to go, you know, we're not talking about the overshare on Facebook, right? That, or, or the, you know, if you've ever been in a small group where someone shares their entire life story, you know, the first night you're meeting, that's not, that's not attractive, right? That, this isn't about, that's counterfeit transparency. Mm -hmm. that, that's for attention or for sympathy, um, what I'm talking about is more in the context of an intimate relationship with a spouse or a good friend of, of if you want to be more fully known or more fully loved, you have to allow yourself to be more fully known. And I think that's a struggle a lot for, for us as, as men sometimes, because either A, we've been wounded or B, we view that as, as kind of fluffy or, or feminine or, or weak. And so I think there is a, uh, an aspect of um, kind of retraining our brains to understand, hey, if I want to be more loved, then I have to allow myself to be more known. And that's a risk. Mm. I think that part there, that di uh, navigating the risk and navigating potential pain, I think is probably um, something that is kind of counter to that fully known element, right? We're always asking... Uh, can I be myself or can I be myself here? Can I be myself with this person? And then yep. will I be loved? Right. Those are the two core questions always yep. goes back to how our parents treated us and, and what they, you know, and what all happened in that relationship and how you were known and seen. Uh, I think that that is uh, really interesting to, to unpack. So my follow up here is that you are, you serve uh, married couples. You work with a lot of men. So mm -hmm. what would you say would be sort of like a central tenant to building these relationships? We are, and one more piece of context, we're in a loneliness epidemic. We've just come out of a, of a time where we are built to see each other face to face. The vast majority of our interactions now are through a technological intermediary where it's difficult to read facial expressions, it's difficult to get the full the full benefit of all the other different kinds of forms of communication. What would what do you suggest that a gentleman does in order to build more healthy relationships in their life? Well, I think that's a, <clears throat> a great question. Um, I think you know the first step is really being honest with yourself. Mm. You know, the greatest deception that we can have is self deception, mm. and so I think once we start telling ourselves the truth, it frees us up then to begin to be more truthful with other people and other, uh, other guys, especially. And I think there is a vulnerability there, right? There is a risk and vulnerability because you can be rejected. You can, uh, you can be hurt if you are vulnerable and someone shuts you down. Or I, I was talking to a guy that I'm coaching and, and we were, we, he was actually local. And so we were having breakfast and his wife doesn't want to go to marriage counseling, but he wants to get better. And so I'm like, you just need to be more vulnerable with her. And so we, we get to breakfast and he's like, 
uh, I did what you told me to do and she made fun of me. And I'm like, well, you can't control her response. You can only control who you are. And I think what happens so often, Jay, is in that situation, we create what Brennan Manning calls imposters. Mm. And there are these false selves that we have for different relationships. We have our false self with our golfing buddies. We have our false self at work. We have our false self, you know, at school. We have our false self um, with our family. We have our false self with God. And we, that, that is the, um, the epitome of being not, not, of not having integrity. Integrity means to be integrated, mm -hmm. right? To be the same person in every environment. And so I think, you know, if you want to have closer relationships, then to maybe evaluate, is there a, you know, um, a disintegration in my life where am I different people in these different environments and how can I become the same person at home that I am at work? How can I become the same person at church that I am at home? And, and evaluating that is going to be a, a step in the right direction of becoming a more integrated, integrity-filled person. I love the theme because this is very central to Feel Good Fatherhood of integrating all aspects of your life. It's not about having a work life. It's not about having a home life. It's not about being a great husband in closed doors and then... Uh, you know, one of my wor the worst stories and, and a person that they immediately, that they said that I thought, oh, this guy's got to get fired from my life, you know, referring mm -hmm. to their wives as balls and chains or, you know, having to go back to the thing, even these like little affectionate things paint, quite frankly, this relationship that you've decided to dedicate your life to in a negative light. And what kind of energy are you bringing in that world? Um, right. I, I love the idea um, of having people in your life that you want to have a, a better relationship with making that statement and then asking them why you want them to come with you. You know, I was thinking about your example. It's like, Hey wife, I want to have a better relationship with you. This is a path that I think I want to go, go to accomplish that. Would you like to come, you know, would mm -hmm. you like to come with me? And uh, yeah. I think that's, that's really powerful. What are, Let's suppose, how do you, as a man now, identify people that, not necessarily that aren't trustworthy, but that don't deserve that same level of attention? Because I think that you need to have people in your life that you just watch the game with. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, even Jesus, you know, if you're a follower of Christ, he had three, he had 12, and then he had, you know, a greater circle around him. And so I think, you know, that's going to be a combination of affinity you know, who, who do I feel com the most comfortable being myself around? Mm. And then it's going to be um, a combination of affinity and then also character and trust. Can I trust this person to be not just who, you know, myself in front of, but can I trust them to be who they say they are? And I think, you know, trust is a two way street. It's, it's me, you know, trusting you, but it's also me being trustworthy to you. Mm. And so I think, you know, if you can evaluate those things, that's going to help you kind of draw kind of an inner circle. And it doesn't mean that other people, you're not in relationship with other people. It just means they don't necessarily get the most innermost parts of you. And that's okay. You know, it's, I think we don't have to feel guilty about that. That's a healthy boundary to maintain in our life. Awesome. Uh, so you've just released a book. It's got a great accolade, USA Today bestseller. Uh, being real is greater than being perfect. I definitely suggest you pick that up. Uh, there'll be a link down in the description, wherever it goes. Justin, uh, anywhere else that people can connect with you to, to learn more about you and what you're about? Yeah. So um, my wife and I have uh, a ministry called Refine Us Ministries. We help couples restore hope, renew relationships. You can go to refineus.org and learn more. There's a bunch of free resources there that you can download as well. And then we also have a podcast called the Let's Get Real podcast, where we talk about life, love, and leadership. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can find that on your favorite podcast platform. It's called Let's Get Real with Justin and Trish. Awesome. Justin, everybody. Hey, if you like this episode of the Feel Good Father podcast, go ahead and hit subscribe. Awesome. And guess what? Thanks so much for tuning in. YouTube has decided that right about here, is the next video. This is going to be a great one. It's one of mine. I guarantee it. I know it's going to add value. Go ahead and click.